Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's Nuclear Energy Agency Expert Roundtable on the role of nuclear energy during COVID and beyond. NEA Director General William D. Magwood IV will host a group of experts to discuss the role of nuclear energy during COVID and beyond. The NEA has prepared a set of policy briefs analysing the various dimensions in which nuclear energy has contributed to ease the present COVID crisis and to the post-COVID economic recovery, as governments make available stimulus packages that will restart the economy at the same time to help move forward with the transition to a carbon-free society. These briefs have been produced with the invaluable collaboration of our colleagues at the World Nuclear Association. People from around the world have registered to take part in this event. To ensure a stable connection and considering this large number of attendees, your video and audio functions have been disabled. You can still actively participate in the discussion by expressing your views, sending your comments and by asking questions via the chat feature. Chats are sent to all panellists, not to all attendees. Now, if you experience any technical difficulties, please try the chat function or email Clément Bonnet. His address was provided with your Zoom link email message. You can also join the webinar via telephone. The international numbers are available in the same message. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the NEA website in the near future. It is now my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Magwood. Well, welcome to everyone. It's a pleasure to have you with us for this NEA web chat uh, regarding the role of nuclear energy during COVID-19 and beyond. First, let me um, express my hope that everyone listening today is uh, doing well, healthy under the situation of which we are still uh, more or less in the middle of, and that um, you and your loved ones have um, come through this well. We um, at the NEA um, have been impacted by the COVID crisis like everyone else. Uh, we have been teleworking uh, for, uh, for four months now and expect to telework for a bit longer, but we've been able to continue the work of our, for our member countries and to engage with all of you through uh, mechanisms like this web chat. We have been observing um, the discussion around the world about how the world will recover from uh, the economic effects of the uh, COVID crisis. And uh, there does seem to be an interest in making investments in infrastructure, particularly in the area of energy. Um, we believe that the investments that are made um, should be made with a long-term view in mind. Um, it is possible that we can spend a lot of money in the short term that the long term will not benefit us. We believe at the NEA that the long-term investments that are made to improve our energy infrastructure to prepare for the low carbon future uh, should include a consideration of nuclear energy. And that is the subject of the various policy briefs that you heard about earlier. We prepared four policy briefs um, focusing on different aspects of this uh, discussion. Uh, the first one is on building low carbon resilient electricity infrastructures using nuclear, nuclear power. Second is the role of nuclear and the cost effective decarbonization of the electricity system. Um, a third one on creating high value jobs. And a fourth one on unlocking the finance necessary for energy infrastructure, particularly in the nuclear area. So these four uh, policy briefs will be available um, by our website. And I hope that they prove to be useful as all of you are discussing the, these issues. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined today by a, a very distinguished panel, um, and they, uh, they, I think they can come online now to, um, to introduce, we will introduce, make three very brief introductions. First, um, the Deputy Minister of Industry and uh, Trade for the Czech Republic, uh, Mr. Rene Nadella has joined us. We're very pleased to have him with us. He is an engineer by training um, <coughs> and has been a lecturer at uh, at um, Czech uh, Technical University in, in technical areas and mechanical engineering. Um, and until and before in his current position, he was director of regulatory section of the Energy Regulatory Office. So I'm very pleased to have him with us. Also uh, with us is Agneta Rising, who almost needs no introduction because I'm sure that many of you listening today know Agneta very well. She's a very close partner uh, to the NEA. And as you heard, um, her organization provide a lot of the industry-related information related to um, the, the discussion we're having today. So Agneta, I'm very pleased to have you with us. Uh, before being uh, Director General of the World Nuclear Association, 
Um, she held positions with Vattenfall uh, AB in, uh, in Sweden and was, um, pre was um, director for nuclear business development at Vattenfall Generation. Also with us um, from the International Energy Agency, our sister organization, <coughs> is Mr. Brent Warner, uh, who is a senior energy analyst um, and lead of the power sector modeling for the World Energy Outlook. Most recently held electricity work in the uh, World Energy Outlook special report on the sustainable recovery and the IEA's Global Energy Review for 2020. We're also joined by Mr. Juan Garon, um, who is a policy analyst and the Directorate for the Financial and Inter Enterprise Affairs at the OECD, um, again, part of our family. Uh, he focuses on sustainable finance and infrastructures. And in addition to supporting the G20 and APEC agendas on infrastructure, he's involved in coordinating a major horizontal project at the OECD on sustainable infrastructure. So we're very pleased to have him with us. We're also joined by uh, Julia Pike, who is a SZC Director of Financing with EDF Energy. Uh, Julia is Director of Financing uh, for the Sizewell C Project, is working with government to identify innovative ways for, for funding and financing uh, at best value for consumers. So we're very pleased to have her with us. And um, last but not least, we have Ate Hajon, uh, who's member of the Finnish Parliament <coughs> and Helsinki City Council. Um, he represents the constituency of Helsinki and the Green Party. And he is also a, a member of the Commerce Committee of this country, a parliamentary body discussing energy policy and, and, and as well as the Defense Committee. He previously worked as a researcher in the Finnish Meteorological Institute studying the social economic impacts of climate change. So it's a very great pleasure to have him and the rest of the panels with us today. Um, as we, as I highlighted, um, the, this discussion about what would, what the world will look like after the COVID-19 crisis is something that we have been very much focused on. And I'm looking forward to the comments from our panel today um, to think about these issues in a very um, long-term view. I, I, there is a tendency, I think, to uh, want to react very quickly uh, to make short-term decisions, but we believe that there's time to make good decisions using the best macroeconomic analysis, analysis such as that put out by the IEA, the NEA, and other organizations um, that look at the, the overall picture of the, of the electricity system and recognize, most importantly, I think, that a resilient, reliable electricity infrastructure is absolutely essential both today, and we certainly have seen that during the COVID crisis, as many of us have relied on electricity, electricity based technologies um, to work and to entertain ourselves and to take care of our families. But in the longer term future, it's going to be even more important. Um, in the future, we will be more electrified. We're, we're looking at the electrification of transportation, more sectors of industry. Electricity will be, um, in my view, the, the determining factor of economic success in the long-term future. And we believe that nuclear can play a very important role in that electricity infrastructure. Um, so because our time is short, I will, I, will, I will stop there and invite Mr. Nadella, the Deputy Minister, um, to, um, to make some opening comments. So sir, you have the floor. So hello, everybody. Good afternoon from Czech Republic. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, excellent. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, to Nuclear Energy Agency and personally to Mr. Megwood uh, for organizing this meeting and for his great job, uh, which is he doing, you know, uh, in, this, uh, in this issue. And because we have just only five minutes, or me, I have five minutes, I will immediately skip uh, into into the topic. Uh, as all we know, the current uh, crisis caused by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic together with the measures taken uh, is having an impact on electrical across Europe. You know, foreign transmission system operator face several problems, usually of a similar nature to uh, our operator CHEPS such as mainly in a decrease in uh, electricity consumption and the impact associated with it. 
the de decline in electricity production is caused by the fact that power balancing resources are operating at uh, technological low or are being shut down. This is, this is like a huge problem also in the Czech Republic that if you want to use uh, frequent sources, you have to pay uh, more, than, uh, more, than, uh, more than usual. The measures taken at the level of states and transmission system operators have also sensitivity affect maintenance and development, development plans. So uh, we know. The good is that uh, the European energy system is safe and uh, there are currently no surf problems uh, in the, uh, in the net network. And now I will skip immediately to the, to the, to the Czech Republic. Uh, as, you, as you know, we have uh, 22 gigawatts in solid capacity, uh, four gigawatts we have uh, in, a, in a nuclear, uh, two gigawatts we have in, in photovoltaic, 300 megawatt in a, in a wind. We have a lot of coal. We have 11, uh, 11 gigawatt in a, in a, in a, in a coal. Uh, Totally, uh, if we will summarize it, then uh, from 30 to 40 percent of total consumption of electricity in Czech Republic uh, is is from uh, is from nuclear energy. So nuclear energy play uh, quite important role in the uh, in the Czech Republic, and also will play the quite uh, important role in the uh, in decarbonization. That's why we want to build new nuclear power plant uh, in the locality Dukovane. Uh, now there is a discussion that it will be one block, around one or 1,200 uh, 200, uh, megawatts. And we hope that this, this new block will start operate in 2036. And uh, how, how, how it was uh, through the uh, COVID-19 and through the, through the crisis. Uh, we, set, we set a special team here at our Ministry uh, of Industry and Trade. Uh, and this team uh, was approximately 60 people. Uh, half was from the, from the uh, energy sector and half was from, from the uh, IT and telecommunications sector. And each Friday we had we had this meeting, and there was quite good discussion how we will face with uh, with the COVID-19 and what is important to do not just only uh, like technically but also in the legislation. Uh, we set the new leg legislation and new rules for for uh, critical infrastructure uh, in the in the Czech Republic during uh, during the during the, the crisis. The the good was that there was no uh, shutdown in Czech Republic caused by COVID-19. That was really uh, important, important for us. Uh, we set the rules for uh, not just only for the, for the nuclear power plant, but also for other power plants that uh, employees have to cover up uh, the nose and the mouth. That was, I think, uh, everywhere. Uh, we reduced. Uh, the number of shifts, you know. Uh, then we uh, then we did uh, temperature measuring at the, at the entrance, so every employees were uh, were measured, you know. Then we did like uh, more fle frequently uh, cleaning, disinfection, um, and other things. Then also we did a can uh, cancellation of all excursion and necessary visits. That was that was also important. And we closed uh, the customer uh, center and transfer of uh, uh, processing and requirements uh, online. Uh, also, one one good uh, example uh, because all our power plants has their own laboratories. So they started to mix uh, uh, disinfection, and we used this disinfection for cleaning, uh, cleaning the surface, and also we use this uh, disinfection, you know, uh, for, uh, for 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 the people. This was this was really important because uh, we in the Czech Republic before COVID nineteen, eighty or ninety percent of disinfection uh, were. 
were from foreign country. And now after COVID-19, we are almost 100% uh, uh, supplied by uh, our companies and uh, our, uh, our producers. That's, uh, that's, that's good. Uh, one more uh, good example. Uh, you can you can see that uh, our two uh, nuclear power plants, uh, Dukovany and Ternalin, were uh, were uh, shut down during uh, during the COVID-19. But this was not because of COVID-19, but it was normally shuttled, and we did the maintenance without any problem. You know, this was this was also like important for us that even uh, even that the situation was very uh, was very bad and it was very difficult you know to to bring uh, experts uh, from other countries to to the Czech Republic you know to uh, to do the maintenance uh, we did it we did it and without any uh, without any problem so uh, just a summary uh, nuclear energy play important role in the Czech Republic. For us, is a safe and stable, stable source. It will play a very important role also, uh, also in, the, in the future. And we hope that uh, not just only um, we, but also other member states uh, will try you know, to help uh, and to promote uh, nuclear nuclear energy uh, as a as a part of um, energy mix uh, 2000 2050 if we want to reach uh, climate neutrality. Thank you. No, well, thank you very much, and I appreciate the, your overview, uh, particularly because um, you highlight some of the measures that were taken to assure safe nuclear safety. And as we've shared this information uh, across uh, our members. Uh, we see many very similar activities in many countries, so I appreciate you highlighting those important uh, measures. Um, I'll move on next to Agneta Rising. Um, Agneta, um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Bill, and thank you for also the kind introduction. And I'm very happy to be part of this panel on what is the really a defining issue for years to come. I'm also very proud of the fact that the World Nuclear Association has worked closely with the OECD NEA and providing factual information on these policy briefs and also to work closely with you in, in, in many other areas as well. I mean, we have really uh, tough times now because we have to put the priorities right. And I hope that after many years later, we will look back at this time and see that we were able to, to manage at the same time the economic recovery the job creation, the energy resilience, and also address climate change. Albert Einstein once said that in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. I believe this describes the situation that we find ourselves in very well, be it the ongoing pandemic or the fight against climate change. Yes, the global coronavirus pandemic will have a long-term impact on all of us, but as we look ahead to the recovery phase, there is a golden opportunity to change and improve, to build a stronger, cleaner, and fairer world. There are opportunities to deliver a pandemic recovery plan, which provides long-term and sustainable economic growth, create high-value jobs and a clean energy future, and ensuring that our society becomes more resilient. It is also important that any recovery plan deliver genuine value for money and investments into existing and new nuclear reactors really fulfill all of these requirements. Investment in nuclear energy brings multiple benefits and offers solutions to the challenges presented by the pandemic. Long-term operation is the cheapest way to generate decarbonized electricity. So we should look to modernization and upgrade as shovel-ready projects could provide immediate employment that create and add long-term value and jobs. A good example of the major employment benefits of future proving existing reactors is the Bruce nuclear power plants in Canada. Refurbishing its six reactors will sustain 22,000 jobs, as well as safeguarding low-cost, reliable carbon-free electricity until 2064. We can also accelerate the implementation of those 438 reactors 
that are already planned and proposed by governments, in addition to the 55 reactors current under construction, this would offer significant high quality jobs and drive economic development. Affordable, clean and reliable electricity from nuclear energy will deliver value for money for the consumers, whilst also ensuring we decarbonize on time and sustainably. A higher share of nuclear energy means lower investment costs and decreases the cost of electricity for the consumer, ensuring a socially, environmentally and just transition to a cleaner future. Nuclear energy generates wealth to every household and to the economy as a whole. For every euro spent in the European nuclear industry means that five euros are generated in the European economy and brings value to every European household. There is a large multiplier effect. In the USA, each dollar spent on, average, on an average nuclear power plant during one year of operation is estimated to bring an additional one dollar of output in the regional economy, another dollar in the state economy, and almost two dollars at the national economy level. This means a multiplier effect of four. Total system costs need to be at the core of government's evaluation of the cost effectiveness of investments in low carbon electricity technologies. Today, the considerable costs required to make variable renewables function as part of electricity system due to their intermittency are barely considered in energy transition plans. And eventually that significant cost must be paid by the consumer or the taxpayer. Use of more nuclear energy brings this cost down to a minimum. Investing in nuclear energy is proven to create a large number of high value and well paid jobs, accelerate the transition to a socially and sustainable low carbon economy and increase energy resilience. Government commitments to construct new reactors would create immediate employment opportunities. A lot of people would say, if we now start to discuss nuclear, it will take a long time to give jobs, but it will come immediate. There is what, about 100 uh, plans that are very close to, to, uh, to the go live, and they can be finished within, within a some few years in the 2020s. And we know that also the new nuclear projects will immediately initiate new uh, work, because as soon as you commit to a nuclear project, that will be a strong signal for investment throughout the supply chain, creating construction and manufacturing capabilities, ensuring skills development, skills which will benefit uh, from the, for the whole economy for decades to come. The nuclear sector generates significantly amount of high skilled, high paid, and mostly local jobs for 80 years. Hinkley Point C in UK is about six, more than 60% is local uh, UK companies. I started my remarks reflecting on that in every crisis opp opportunities can be found and I believe that we can respond to the ongoing pandemic and its impacts and it gives us a golden opportunity to build a genuinely sustainable world. Unfortunately, we know that the existing national policies do not meet the Paris Agreement. We need to build a more sustainable future. And the global nuclear industry is ready to deliver and to meet these demands. We have set a harmony goal of, of supplying 25% of electricity by 2050. And many of these projects are shovel ready and can start immediately and create jobs and economic growth. Thank you very much, Agneta. So let me quickly move on to uh, Brent. Uh, Brent, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Bill, and thank you to the NEA for, for uh, inviting me to the event today and for, for hosting this and for the, the policy briefs um, being released. I wanted to just say, um, give a few highlights from uh, a recent report that we released uh, outlining a sustainable recovery plan. This was released last week, um, and I think uh, it goes hand in hand with the discussion today. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So just, uh, I think this has mainly been covered, but a few words on context. I think we know well but that the COVID-19 pandemic um, has delivered the biggest global economic shock in peacetime since the 1930s. And this has severe impacts on employment and investment in all sectors, including energy. 
Um, there are thought to be about 300 million jobs at risk globally. Um, and if we think about the energy sector, this number is about 6 million jobs, we estimate, um, in the energy sector or energy related jobs. Now that's 6 million out of about 40 million total jobs. Um, so a very large proportion uh, of the energy related jobs being at risk. And that's in the same time that we've seen that reliable energy supplies, reliable electricity have been paramount to modern economies continuing functioning during the crisis. Now, if we think of overall uh, CO2 emissions or energy related CO2 emissions, we see that because of the reduced economic activity, global CO2 emissions are set to decline by about 8% in 2020. Um, but this is, these are for all the wrong reasons. And experience suggests that a rebound is very likely if we don't put clean energy transitions at the heart of the economic recovery. Now, to date already, governments are responding to the economic crisis on a massive scale. Um, more than $9 trillion has been committed uh, through measures that are mainly focused on emergency financial and economic relief to prevent an even deeper crisis. But as we see more stimulus coming and attention shifting to the longer term, it's essential that efforts are aligned with national and global objectives on energy reliance and sustainable development. Now for the report, uh, which is now available, we, we have looked at uh, sector by sector, over 30 specific energy measures that governments may want to include in their economic recovery plans. It draws a new analysis on the direct and indirect jobs created by different measures. We worked with the International Monetary Fund, assessing the impact of these measures on global economic growth. And ultimately, they, they are intended to deliver a cleaner, cleaner, more affordable, more secure, and more resilient energy system. If you could go to the next slide, please. So there are three essential pillars to the sustainable recovery plan, um, looking to ultimately deliver cost-effective measures, cost-effective, uh, to take cost-effective measures that can be done quickly. Um, these are considering the, taking into account the circumstances of individual countries, existing project pipelines, and the current market, market conditions. And those three pillars are to one, create jobs, two, to boost uh, economic growth, and three, to then improve energy resilience and sustainability. If you go to the next slide, please. The plan outlines spending, additional spending of about $1 trillion per year globally. That's from 2021 to 2023, which is equal to about 0.7% of global GDP today. And that includes both public and private finance um, mobilized through public policies. To give you an idea that the public spending element of that is less than a trillion dollars over three years is about less is less than 10 percent of what's been announced already to date in terms of stimulus and if we compare that to the recovery from the 2008-2009 financial crisis where we had 16 percent of the stimulus money going to green measures so the plan sets out policies and targets uh, for six uh, six sectors and electricity is a main component of, of the overall plan, focusing on expanding low carbon electricity sources like wind and solar, modernizing the, the transmission and distribution grids to support the clean energy transitions, and very critically for today's discussion about maintaining the role of nuclear power through lifetime extensions and those new construction projects that are shovel ready, uh, as Agneta mentioned previously. So we see these all being a package, all low carbon sources being critical to the overall pursuit of a more resilient and more efficient and sustainable uh, energy sector. Efficiency is of course at the heart of the plan uh, with measures in transport, buildings and industry. And when we look to other areas, we're talking about the production of fuels being more sustainable, but also to boost innovation through new crucial technologies like hydrogen, batteries, carbon capture utilization storage, and small modular nuclear reactors. Uh, next slide, please. So the impacts of the, the plan, to kind of give you the three highlights, are the impacts on economic growth, working with the International Monetary Fund, we estimate to be about 1.1% additional economic growth globally each year over the next three years, bringing us to about 3.5% higher by 2023. That would leave lasting benefits to the global economy um, not only in the energy economy, but then also the induced jobs that have been mentioned previously. 
Next slide, please. Looking at the employment aspect, we are set to, they're at risk to lose about 6 million jobs, energy related jobs in 2020. The plan outlines ways to gain or save about 9 million energy related jobs in each year over the next three years. And you can see that this is split amongst sectors with electricity playing a, a growing role in those new, uh, those new job creation, which are largely around construction uh, and manufacturing for the near term, but then creating longer term permanent jobs. Uh, next slide, please. And ultimately, the, if we think about the sustainability of the, uh, of the plan or the, the sustainability aspect, we look at the past history here where in 2008, 2009, we saw a reduction in emissions, but then a very quick rebound uh, in 2010 and return to growth. Now, this is something we clearly want to avoid. And there are, at this point, two paths, very distinct paths that lie ahead of us. One, a return to business as usual, where we return to growth, uh, emissions rebound, and we continue growing. Or uh, we look to this opportunity to ensure that 2019 is the absolute peak in global emissions, and we look to pursue a more sustainable pathway here, reducing emissions substantially as we go forward. We see this two and a half gigaton drop in 2020, but with the implementation of sustainable recovery plan, we could continue to reduce emissions and ultimately put us on a long-term plan towards meeting our long-term climate goals, including the Paris Agreement. And final slide, please. So just to conclude, uh, to highlight these points, we're, we're at, a, at a stage where policymakers have to make enormously consequential decisions in a very short space of time. These decisions will shape economic and energy infrastructure for decades to come, and certainly determine whether the world has a chance of meeting its long-term energy and climate goals. The Sustainable Recovery Plan is not intended to tell governments what they must do. It seeks to show them what they can do. And governments have a unique opportunity today to boost economic growth, create millions of new jobs, and put global greenhouse gas emissions into structural decline. So with this report, we've tried to identify the most cost-effective measures available, outlining the menu of options for governments, but also industry and the investment community. And ultimately, we will be bringing then these together, these groups together to identify how to act on the findings of the report uh, in an event on the 9th of July, the IEA Clean Energy Transition Summit. And with that, I'll close here and, and thank also the NEA for their contributions and review of the report prior to its release and uh, the opportunity to present these highlights for you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. And we appreciate um, you giving us an overview of the um, the study that the IEA has performed. I, I think one, one comment I would make also is that it's very important that while organizations like the IEA, IEA and the NEA give our, our views, each national government really has to look at this particular situation carefully. And that's where this issue that Agneta mentioned about system costs becomes very important because the, 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 the resources, the grid, um, the, the options to or different from country to country. And if you're going to have an economic approach, a sustainable approach, you really have to look at this on a country by country basis. So what we do helps countries do that, but they really have to do the work themselves. And I, I think it's important to always highlight that. Um, let me ask uh, Juan to uh, give his comments. Thank you very much, Bill, and uh, thank you to the NEA for the opportunity to present in this webinar. Uh, essentially, I'm going to focus on some work that the OECD is doing that is both timely and relevant in the context of the post-COVID recovery. Um, next slide, please. So when, when considering infrastructure investment in the context of the recovery from COVID, there are two aspects that stand out. So first, the crisis has highlighted how healthcare systems and digital infrastructure have coped and adapted, uh, in some cases better than others, to deal with the surge in demand. So looking ahead, uh, governments will need to ensure that both existing infrastructure and new infrastructure is resilient against not only pandemics, but against a range of other hazards, uh, such as climate risks, natural disasters, and human-made disasters, such as cyber threats. The second aspect is that 
infrastructure has a critical role to play in contrib to contributing to recovery, but there's increasing agreement, as was mentioned by a number of the panelists, that it needs to be a strong, green, resilient, inclusive, and ultimately sustainable recovery. Um, however, uh, policymakers are confronted with multiple dilemmas and trade-offs in pursuing these two these goals. So on the one hand, they face uh, exploding budgetary demands and increasing debt, uh, debt levels. Um, and therefore, public investment is likely to be constrained by these factors. Secondly, there is an increasing recognition that economic efficiency needs to be balanced with, um, with resilience considerations. And so the pursuit of efficiency at all costs can result in brittle systems that are unable to cope with shocks. So addressing these dilemmas will require smart decisions and smart financing. And smart decisions uh, to make sure that the best projects, projects get built um, and thus to make sure to make sure the most effective use of public funds and smart financing to ensure that public funds go as far as possible with the greatest possible impact. Um, so the OECD has developed a wealth of standards and guidance that can help in making both smart decisions and uh, financing smarter. Uh, next uh, slide, please. However, that guidance has been fragmented and dispersed across 17 directorates. Um, what we are currently doing now, though, is uh, engaging in an effort to develop a compendium of policy good practices for quality infrastructure investment uh, that consolidates and synthesizes the wide range of standards and guidance within the OECD, and thus providing a, a single entry point for this guidance. Um, so the compendium is a set of voluntary, integrated, and multidisciplinary international good practices to support policymakers and practitioners in implementing quality infrastructure. Um, the, uh, it flows from a G20 initiative developed uh, under the Japanese presidency in 2019, um, which led to the endorsement of the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment. These uh, principles uh, are therefore a strong uh, international consensus on what constitutes quality infrastructure invest investment. And the compendium is really there to support the implementation of quality infrastructure and its principles. So it's a cross-cutting initiative that um, includes over 340 good practices and measures uh, drawn from across a wide range of standards. Um, and its uh, compendium is, is virtually um, finalized and will, will be released soon um, as it goes through the relevant approval processes, which is likely to be later in the summer. Uh, next slide, please. So the compendium provides a holistic framework for implementing quality infrastructure investments that are aligned with the G20 principles and can and support inclusive, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable recovery. The good practices are structured according to the G20 principles, which include, first of all, maximizing the positive impact of infrastructure to achieve, the, to achieve sustainable growth and development. Secondly, raising economic efficiency in view of life cycle costs. Third, integrating environmental considerations and in infrastructure investments. Fourth, building resilience against natural disasters and other risks. Fifth, integrating social considerations and six, strengthening infrastructure governance. We have also included in the compendium a section on financing because of the, the importance of mobilizing financing for quality infrastructure. Um, uh, so I, I will, uh, you know, given the, as you will understand, given the, the number of uh, good practices, it's impossible to provide a complete picture. So if you switch to the next slide, please, I will just highlight a few uh, good practices that are particularly um, relevant perhaps, and um, that you know, relate to a contributing to a strong, green, uh, resilient and inclusive recovery. So in, in the policy and institutional environment, um, one good practice uh, that actually relates to uh, the nuclear sector and is, is about resilience, um, uh, is about ensuring that the existing nuclear facilities consider the possibility of extreme weather events resulting from climate change as a necessary requirement of long-term operation. Um, in terms of infrastructure planning, um, one recommendation in the compendium is for, uh, to ensure that um, infrastructure plans are aligned with the Paris Agreement and NDCs. Uh, and I'm running out of time, so I will just uh, uh, conclude by mentioning one more in the importance of financing and in terms of project development, the need to take into consideration the nature of investments and the risk return characteristics in identifying relevant financing and funding mechanisms, which is uh, particularly important for the nuclear sector. So the aim, finally, is for this compendium to be a living document that will evolve and adapt to reflect changes to the underlying standards and guidance 
as well as new guidance that has developed over time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Juan. And I, I appreciate you highlighting the financing aspect of this. I think I did mention this as well. And um, we, we have been planning a, um, um, a workshop on innovative financing um, that unfortunately was postponed because of the COVID crisis. But when we get this back on track, uh, we look forward to working with, uh, with you and your colleagues in, um, in highlighting um, different approaches to financing infrastructure. Um, let me quickly move on to uh, Julia Pike from ADF. Julia, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bill. So could we go to the first slide, please? So um, this is a picture of the UK's energy use by source during June in um, COVID. And you can see that during, during June, we've had some very significant lulls in wind. And actually, these have been um, quite common across Northern Europe. So what that's meant in the UK is that we're burning an awful lot of gas. And um, in the UK, all of the nuclear is closing down over the 2020s, except for Sizewell B, which provides about 3% of UK demand and then Hinkley will come on in the mid 2020s to meet a further seven. But unless we um, get on with building some new nuclear, that blue line providing um, stable, non-weather dependent, clean electricity will be halved for the UK. So can we um, move to the next slide, please? So as, um, as Anita said, the um, socioeconomic of of impact of Hinkley in the UK um, is huge. Um, there's about 64% of, uh, of the economic content benefits the UK. That means that Hinkley is putting 14 billion into the UK economy during its construction period. It's creating 25,000 job opportunities. It's already put 1.7 billion into the regional economy of the Southwest of England during its construction so far. And what we want to do is to build an exact copy of Hinkley at Sizewell C in Suffolk on the east coast of England. And in building an exact copy, if we look at financing, it gives us opportunities to actually use innovative financing because construction risk is so far reduced. If we know exactly what we're building, then we know what quantities we're buying. We know, um, we know how to do what we're doing. We're seeing fantastic productivity benefits between the two units at Tinkley. So we recently achieved a milestone of the um, reactor base for unit two at Hinkley, and we've seen productivity increases like 45% for the time it takes to in install a ton of steel. And that's repeated right across all sorts of different aspects of the plant. So if we are able to start building Sizewell C in a time frame that we can use the key members of the experienced team, that means that we should be able to treat Sizewell as though it's units three and four of Hinkley and see those same productivity benefits brought over to Sizewell and improved further. And we've recently started looking at Moorside on the west coast of England, which is a site which is next to Sellafield, um, where um, there are great opportunities to build an industrial cluster um, as well as a power station. So if we can look at the next slide. In the UK, we've, we've used nuclear quite unimaginatively. We've sort of, we've taken 40% of the heat it creates and we've, then we've cooled 60% and put it back into the sea. Um, and so what we're looking at with Sizewell is that the only variation above ground to the concept of replication will be putting in valves to take some of the heat out so that we can use the heat for heat assisted hydrogen electrolysis, so that we can offer it for industrial process and for district heating. I know that a lot of other countries um, have already made much more imaginative use of nuclear, but for the UK, this will be the first time. And amongst, aside from being a very useful way of contributing to one of the greatest challenges we all face, it, it, well, particularly in the UK, which is to decarbonize heating, um, it enables the value of nuclear to be modeled differently from, from it, from only its place in the electricity system. So if we can look at the next slide, um, a, lot of, a lot of people talk about hydrogen and um, hydrogen is great and lots of people have vision. We have a vision, which is to create hydrogen from Sizewell C, it takes a lot of time to build. We would like to start this year, next year, with a small two, um, two megawatt demo electrolyzer to show what can we do. So this can enable us to have much cleaner construction 
So we could, for example, have a fleet of hydrogen buses to take the workers around the site. We can experiment with hydrogen powered construction vehicles and electric construction vehicles. So we're hoping to get that going and have some sort of real granular progress. If we can quickly look at the next slide. Um, just, this is just showing how, um, as well as putting 4 billion into the regional economy of the southwest of Hinkley, of the east of England for Sizewell, <clears throat> and we hope the northwest of England for Moorside, the, the supply chain is actually all over the UK already. We have 2,500 UK suppliers, and we've recently been able to announce things like 350 jobs in um, Immingham and in Warrington, another 100 with A systems in Blackburn. And these are fantastic opportunities, and particularly in COVID, the combination of us being able to offer apprenticeships, skills training, and really good high quality jobs, and then, and then to have some continuity through keeping those going through actually a program of build is what we are looking to do. So I think my time is up, but I'm very happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you very much, and I, I appreciate you highlighting the, the training that you've been that's been getting done in um, in England because I've toured some of the training facilities and colleges, and it's extremely impressive. And you see so many young people getting um, skills and that they would never have had an opportunity to, to do before. And these are skills that can be applied outside the nuclear sector. So it's something that provides for long-term employability. So it's a it's really a fantastic uh, activity there. It is. Um, la last but not least, uh, Mr. Herjan uh, from the uh, Parliament of Finland, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, an honor to be uh, talking in this, in this webinar, and we can jump right up to the next slide. So, uh, uh, greetings from, from Helsinki, Finland. I'll, I'll, this is a Finnish perspective, but I try to generalize as well. Uh, as I think Agneta, Bryn, Kuli, others have pointed out, um, COVID-19 is, is, is changing the world. And from the energy policy perspective, I'd say that, for example, we, uh, we estimate, uh, or this is a WMO estimate of, of dropping of emissions of 6%. I think uh, Brent showed uh, IEA is a bit more recent, 8%. But we're still talking about even a shock like COVID-19 within our current energy economy only brings emissions down as much as they should be getting down year by year for us, us to reach the Paris Agreement goals. Uh, so that kind of tells us that we are not, we, we are facing a challenge that we, we, we're any kind of incremental change or incremental development in, in decarbonization is not enough. We need to see like rapid deep decarbonization ongoing um, and make sure that uh, the developing countries are also in the path that they, they will go straight as, as, as decarbonized as possible. Uh, other aspect, of the COVID-19 crisis has been the emphasizing of security of supply and resilience pointed out also earlier. And, and due to the origins of, of this crisis, also I think at least in here, the biodiversity uh, and the conservation of biodiversity is rising amongst climate, uh, alongside climate change as a, uh, as a more, uh, 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 it, it's rising as an issue on the political agenda, which is uh, important since it's a, it's a great global threat as well. And on a local level, we see the uh, people's awareness of, of the significance of the of the harms of air pollution um, and uh, and the, uh, the benefits of, of clean environment more and more. Uh, both because of, we see that the air pollution causes stress to the body that kind of uh, is bad when you're having a respiratory disease ongoing. And then uh, at least in here, people we've been a rapid. We've seen a, a huge growth in, in people going to parks and national parks and, and then enjoying the outdoors now that they can't travel or work inside so much. Um, then, of course, uh, 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 I guess globally, we, we see a boost on different kind of green recovery plans, perhaps the European Union's um, uh, still debated um, target uh, is the biggest, package is the biggest one. Um, uh, and we see as, as a lot of public finance is pouring and investments are pouring in that means kind of what we see within energy policy perhaps a bit of like more elements of plant economy increasing so so politicians are more on, on uh, have a greater role in in uh, saying where the where the money is going 
But as, as I think uh, Agneta was saying, uh, uh, this is uh, this is uh, we're, we're definitely seeing kind of like a transitional phase, which provides a window window of opportunity to to uh, get the energy economy on a on a better path. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, nuclear uh, energy uh, definitely fits the bill if we if we look at this these issues uh, I brought up with, with it's a secure non-combustion combustion based it's low carbon it's limited land use so all of the all of the matters I brought it out show that actually nuclear energy is, is something that that um, addresses this uh, this uh, issue we're facing and because of that it's it's really important that, that we should include nuclear in any of these green recovery plans and and, and also uh, to point out one is the EU taxonomy and sustainable finance uh, which guides a lot of the European uh, finance is now going to green recovery, but it should also also include nuclear alongside sustainable renewables. So it's important not to make this as a, a, a battle between renewables and uh, nuclear power, but instead I would say um, uh, the technology neutrality is, is the key that we should assess different technologies alongside uh, uh, in a balanced way. And this is something that the uh, Commerce Committee here in, in the Finnish Parliament has also pointed out. But I think it's also important when we're in a transitional phase like this that we see innovation ambition among nuclear energy industry uh, as well. Uh, um, as uh, Julia was pointing out, there's the heat issue. It's not just the electricity. Uh, then we'll also see like uh, new, uses, new uses of nuclear are needed and also new models of, of uh, nuclear power like small module reactors um, and uh, among sites uses different kind of power to X, X uh, um, applications, maybe sh shipping as well. So this now is the time to bring up with this stuff, not just say that, uh, not, not to protect just the, the nuclear industry as it is, but the industry should also come up with ambitious plans on how to do, how to provide this, this uh, solutions for the deep decarbonization we're facing. But at the policy level, I think the most important thing is, is, uh, is stop mixing means and ends. Um, we should prioritize uh, cutting down emissions, protecting biodiversity, providing uh, secure energy. And for this, I think more system level kind of deep decarbonization analysis is needed. Um, I think uh, we have a good example from Finland, which is we, 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 we're just finalizing this so-called industry low carbon roadmap where different industries in the country had to provide a roadmap, technological roadmaps on how they will meet our, our ambitious climate goal of being carbon neutral by 2035. And this, this, uh, these roadmaps showed, for example, that the, that the need for electricity uh, goes 50% up by 2035 and, and doubles by 2050. And so this type of analysis provides us uh, with the numbers of how much clean electricity we need, how much clean heating we need. And this then again kind of shows again that we, this is difficult or probably uh, more honest to say impossible to meet without new nuclear as well. So I, I, would, uh, I would emphasize the need of this type of kind of systemic roadmap type of uh, uh, looking at how do we reach these actual, not just, not just uh, the next uh, drops in, in greenhouse gases, but how do we go from today into, uh, into a, a deeply decarbonized energy economy um, in a manner and what type of investment that, that takes and, and what policy instruments are needed. But yeah, but I think I'll stop here so we'll have more time for, for the debate. Thank you. So, thank you very much. And um, we're, we're a little bit over our scheduled time. Um, we're supposed to end in three minutes, but with the agreement of the panelists, I'll let this go for a few more minutes and and we'll hopefully some of most of the audience can stay with us for a little bit longer. Um, and I saw several questions about getting the slides. I, I, we'll, we'll certainly uh, try to compile some of these uh, slides for the website so that people can see them. And of course, the video will be um, will be available as well. Um, let me let me let me start by asking a, a, a question, which I think is really at the heart of a lot of this, which is how do we pay for the, all these things? And in their term, uh, is Julia. Maybe I'll start with you because um, you you talked about the the next projects after Hinkley Point C. 
And I know that the discussion about financing is still pretty active in the UK. What, what do you see as the, the, the logical landing place for this conversation? So I think the logical landing place is that the UK's model, which is developer led in which you know, utilities have come along and spent billions of pounds trying to bring forward nuclear projects, that that's just not going to work anymore. And you know, COVID has simply accelerated what was already happening. And what's going to need to happen is that the government needs to um, put forward a financing framework in which either government alone or probably preferably government with the pension funds sector or the, the financial investment sector, but particularly pension funds who, um, who have an, an intense interest in finding long-term stable inflation linked sterling products um, are able to put forward their money. So what this is about is getting the risk allocation right between the um, consumer and the developers so that, so that the development company in the ownership of, for example, pension funds is incentivized to um, keep down the cost of construction, um, but that the financing model allocates risks so the cost of capital is low. I and mean, I think a really instructive figure always to remember is that in the £92.50 cost per megawatt hour for Hinkley, £11 represents the cost of construction, £20-odd pounds represents the cost of operations, and all the rest of it is about the cost of money. It's a combination of rolling up interest through the whole construction period and um, getting the developer to take all of the construction risk. If you address that, those two things, which you're more easily able to address if you are building a copy reactor, then um, we are looking at prices for Sizewell um, from sort of 40 to 60 pounds a megawatt hour um, with, with, private, with private finance involved um, and obviously lower than that if it's wholly financed by the UK government. So I appreciate hearing that. And let, let me ask Juan to comment on this because I, I know that the OECD looks at this in a very broad fashion. And maybe Juan, you could provide some of your thoughts about, about that, about what Julia just had to say. Uh, thanks, Bill. I, I would uh, completely agree with Julia. Um, and uh, I think, you know, as Julia said, you know, financing costs and makeup are really predominant in terms of in the nuclear sector right now. And so the key is how to get that lower. And that comes down to risk allocation, as Julia mentioned. Um, and, and obviously construction costs are a big part of that. Um, so we, that's clearly uh, it requires a, a lot of innovation. Um, and there are some new uh, models that are coming, that are sort of emerging. For instance, there's something called asset recycling, which involves the government really taking on the construction risk um, and, and thus, you know, lowering the financing costs that way and then transferring the assets to the private sector uh, once the, the asset is operational. Um, and that, that, that it can be one way of, of lowering the overall financing costs. Um, but we are generally looking at uh, the role of institutional investors at the OECD in financing infrastructure and we have um, a task force that is focused on this, on this topic um, and a lot of the work of the G20 um, on infrastructures is also focused on, on how to mobilize the uh, institutional investment to um, financing infrastructure projects. It, it really it really does come down to how it comes down to risk risk management in any project and and particularly with um, when countries are embarking on nuclear for the first time or they haven't built nuclear plants in a long time the risks are, are higher than they would be for a country like well let's say where UK will be after Hinkley Point C is done. Um, and the only way to manage those risks, it seems, is for governments to step in and, and, and moderate them. Um, so let me ask our government representatives here. I'll start with Mr. Nadella. I mean, how, how do governments look at this? Do governments look at this as their responsibility to manage these risks? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I think that this is this is the the most important question, you know, about the about the financing and how a government can be involved uh, in this in this project. For example, we in the Czech Republic, we are thinking that the government will borrow the money uh, to the investor, uh, then then the investor that the government will take care uh, the risk uh, of this of this money. And we think that the final price, you know, we are talking about the off-date contract in, a, in the Czech Republic, uh, can be lower uh, than, uh, than the market price. So we are talking that the government will uh, be in this project active. 
Mr. Hajon, does that sound right to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with this. I, I, I think this type of investments are such that it's natural that you have a more like a stronger role of public and perhaps state-owned enterprises as well. But yeah, I, I agree with that. And and I guess a, a question, and let me let me ask Agneta this question. I guess the question is, do um, does the industry feel that they that the they're talk that the governments they talk to um, realize that, understand that, appreciate that, and are responsive to that? What, what are you hearing from your your members? Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, we see that we need to bring nuclear to to many other countries as well, and I think we now have had a discussion very much about uh, the industrialized uh, world. And already there we have uh, uh, this issue where the governments need to step in. And we see that though there are countries around, for instance, in Europe who want to build nuclear, they have had problems with the financing. And I would say also, I would like to, to expand the question to the developing countries as well, because we need to, to have, for instance, multilateral banks, the World Bank, they need also to, support nuclear projects. So we need to have many ways to do this. And that, uh, there is lots of interest to build nuclear, but this financing part is something that we see is, uh, is blocking this uh, development. And I think we need to have a, a good session on this. There are many ways to, to finance infrastructure projects, but governments have to have an active role, but also those banks who are supposed to support developing countries also need to, uh, to have a role in here. I know I didn't answer your questions exactly. I expanded it, Bill, sorry. No, no, that's fine because you raise a very important point. Um, over the last, during this month, we've had a series of webinars through IFNIC, uh, the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, uh, focusing on small modular reactors. And um, in, that, um, um, in, in, those, in that venue, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, emerging economies, developing countries, uh, they have expressed a strong interest in uh, building new nuclear plants, and um, and financing has come up as one of the one of the, the, the big barrier issues that that gets discussed. Um, I, recognizing that um, that we're already over our, our time, but um, to give um, I want to give Mr. Um, um, Mr. Um, uh, Warner a chance to to comment on this financing issue, and then we'll wrap up. Thanks very much. Uh, just to uh, just add a point that I think this it very much speaks to the technology neutrality uh, approach and that we do need all low carbon technologies to be part of a sustainable solution. If we look at what's happening in the market for renewables now in most uh, in many countries, uh, auction schemes are, are gaining in prominence and generally they lead to a long term contract that provides uh, that re dramatically reduces the amount of risk that gives access to very cheap capital. Um, and we don't necessarily see this across all low carbon technologies. We, if, we, if we look at uh, across the power sector really at large, you see very few new investments being made facing market risk. So I think when we're, if we're kind of serious about technology neutrality um, for all the low carbon technologies, it's important that they be able to access these large pools uh, of low cost capital, uh, like the institutional investors that were mentioned. Um, and ultimately, that will help bring down the cost of low carbon energy uh, for the world uh, and for all consumers. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, again, I apologize for having a trunk, such a short uh, conversation, but um, I, will, I will stretch it a little bit further and give each of you maybe a, a last comment. Uh, maybe if you will take 30 to 60 seconds with a thought that you would like to leave with the audience. Now, I'll go in reverse order and. Um, and let uh, Mr. Hajan go first. Thank you. Uh, I'll just, I, I just answered there on the chat as well, but I would emphasize and, and on the policy side, I think this uh, kind of doing the math with the challenges we're facing, that's, that's the way to deliver the message of why we need nuclear alongside the renewables. I think that's, that's the tool to help. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, we also took note of your comment about wanting to have a deep decarbonization approach in Finland. Uh, we at the NEA would love to work with you on that. So please, um, please feel free to contact us. Uh, Julia, last thought. 
Um, I think my last thought is that I agree with everybody that we need nuclear to support growing renewable sector and I sort of really plea to governments to um, enable builds to start before we you know, change designs again and, um, and you know, we're, we're always in a world of first of a kind. I think enabling fleet build is um, what we all need to do. I could not agree more. I think that's our, one of the, big, the biggest misconceptions about nuclear is that it always costs too much, but it only costs too much if you're not good at building your plants. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> and you um, can't demonstrate cost reduction if there are no projects in which to demonstrate right. it. That's right. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. And uh, Juan, your turn. Hey, thanks, Bill. I'd like to come back to something that you mentioned when opening, and that is on the importance of considering the long term. And even though um, there is a great deal of urgency with the COVID crisis to really invest to you know, stimulate the economy, it's really important that those investments be uh, aligned with you know, long-term policy priorities. And, and therefore, it means that planning needs to be still looking long-term, even if we're trying to also address short-term uh, you know, stimulus measures. Excellent thought. Thank you very much. Brent. Thanks. I would just uh, highlight a, a similar point there that we uh, ultimately we need to take uh, take steps now to follow a sustainable recovery that then also becomes part of the grand coalition to to ultimately tackle climate change. We are uh, more or less um, have an opportunity, uh, certainly not the conditions we would have wanted, but an opportunity nonetheless to continue to drive down. Uh, global greenhouse gas emissions, and it's, it's one that can be can be achieved. Excellent. Thank you very much. Agneta. So oh, thank you. Thank you, Bill. First of all, I will go back to what I said at the beginning. I think it's, an, it's a golden opportunity to, to be able to do economic recovery, job creation, energy resilience, and address the climate change at the same time. And I hope that in 10 years down the line, we look back at this time, and we were looking to science, we were looking to facts, we were doing a real evaluation of how to do this cost effectively. And then the money we put into this crisis after uh, uh, the recovery after the crisis will have been the best used money and we will have a better world. No, th thank you very much, Agna. And thank you again for the, the cooperation with the, between the WNA and, and the NEA to, to generate some of these, these papers. And I'll, I'll just observe that I often think about this in terms of how will people look at what we did today 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or 30 years from now. And, and, and sometimes it, um, it makes you a bit nervous to think about how people will look at us <laughs> from the future. Um, and finally, uh, Mr. Nadella. I will put two comments. First comment is taxonomy. Taxonomy will play a crucial role in a, in a financing. So this is the first. And the second comment will be heating and cooling sector. Uh, as Julia says, using a heat from the nuclear power plant is a quite, is a quite good. Uh, we started in Czech Republic project one year ago, uh, building a pipe, a heating pipe from, uh, from a Pemelin to České Budějice. And I hope like that this winter, uh, people in the České Budějice will use the heat from uh, Pemelin nuclear power plant. Thank you. Uh, excellent point. And I think that too often um, heat is lost in the conversation. We do focus on electricity, but there's always going to be a need for heat, uh, both for in, uh, residential heating, but also industrial heating. And, and nuclear can play a big role in that. And I've seen the pipeline, so I'm, I'll be excited to see that when it, gets, uh, when it goes into operation. Uh, so again, I, I thank all of you for being with us. Your comments are very insightful. I see lots of very positive comments from the audience. Uh, thank you for being with us and to the audience. Thank you for joining us and uh, watch this space. We have more webinars coming um, and we look forward to having you join us at that time. Um, so with that, Andrew, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you and thank you again to all our speakers for their presentations and to all of you who've enjoyed this today's webinar. We'd like to remind you that all the policy briefs discussed today can be downloaded from the NEA website. Um, at www.oecd-nea.org. For more updates and news, we also encourage you to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thank you, and goodbye for now. <laughs>